Good evening, everybody. Hey, how many of you enjoyed that worship? Man, what? If you, can, if you can't feel good after worship like that, you just can't feel good. And uh, if you can't preach the word after worship like that, you better just try to get into something else. So, uh, man, I'm excited to be here. Uh, you may be thinking, hey, that's not Pastor Chad. You would be correct. My name is Bruce. I'm one of the pastors here at Coastal. And uh, we're, uh, I'm excited about being able to share on this first Wednesday as we continue our series in the book of John. And when you came in, you may have noticed that on the seat, there's some material that's there. One, uh, there's an a, a offering envelope for those that you want to give, uh, maybe in a tithe or an offering, put it in the boxes in the back. But also want to uh, let you know that we have our, um, our dollar club. How many of you are familiar with the dollar club? Man, tonight would be a good night to take advantage of that. I know that uh, through the summer months, we're using that to help kids get to camp. And uh, camp is a wonderful thing, and we want to do our part to help with that. Uh, This evening, we want to also pray for Pastor Chad. How many of you love our pastor? (laughs) Amen. And uh, I was text messaging with him. I'm so thankful that he takes time for himself and his family. Uh, There's no merit badges in ministry for burning out. Did you hear what I said? Uh, there's no merit badges for burning out. There's too many pastors that burn the candle on both ends and uh, don't love their congregations, the ministry, their family enough to take the time. But uh, our pastor does. And uh, I hope you're praying for him every day like I am and that the Lord will bring him back refreshed. Not only refreshed, but renewed with vision for our church. What's happening here, it's special. It's unique. It's not happening everywhere. And uh, that's evident by... You that are here and the people that are coming, and we're just asking the Lord that, man, he'll just continue to get that fresh revelation from the Lord. How many of you are ready to hear from the Word tonight? Amen. Amen. I hope that you are, and uh, I'm excited to share. I want to make one more note. Uh, Those of you that came in and you're looking at your paperwork, there's homework that is there. And uh, you may be thinking, what? Homework? Man, it's summer. Summer. Uh, the homework is designed for those that are going through the summer school. How many of you were here last week when Pastor Charlie shared from John chapter 4? And uh, what a great job he did with the Bible study. Well, that homework is part of our summer school series. And uh, if you're here, you want to use that as sort of a, uh, an addition to your devotions through the week. We encourage you to do that. And uh, if you haven't uh, heard about or taken advantage of summer school, uh, we're going to be doing that every Wednesday through the summer. And uh, Pastor Charlie and I will be switching back and forth. So uh, let's look at the word tonight and then pray. John chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, it says, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one, of the, for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded and covered by five colonnades. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be together. Lord God, to study your word. Lord, tonight I ask that, Lord, that you just will. Lord, supply the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, for each of us, the anointing to speak and to share clarity of thought. Lord, for me, I pray for those that are here that the anointing will rest upon their ears and their hearts. Lord God, that they can hear and receive. But God, I pray especially, Lord, for all of us, that we will not just hear your word, but God, you'll give us grace and strength to do your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. In John chapter 4, we learned last week that there's a, a great revival that happens in Samaria. Uh, Jesus is there. He speaks to the woman that's at the well uh, and <clears throat> on Sunday. And uh, there's this wonderful event that takes place. And as John is recording, one of the things that uh, we understand about the book of John is, is that John is incredibly intentional. His book is written much later than the other synoptic gospels. He's had many years to contemplate what it is he wants to share about Christ and what points that he's trying to make. We know that from John chapter 4, the intentionality of Christ, where it says that he had to go by the way of Samaria. There was a quicker way to get to where he was going, but Jesus knew that there was a mission, there was a task that had to be done. And John is very deliberate to point out that, hey, whatever Jesus is doing, it's not happenstance. It's not just, you know, by chance that things are taking place, but it's an intentional uh, plan that Jesus is working. And John in chapter 5, he continues on with this, and as Jesus is coming into the city of Jerusalem, it says that he is coming by way of that north gate or the, the sheep gate. 
And in John chapter 5, in the beginning, there's a lot of symbolic things. There's 38 years that the man has been there and a lot of those different things that are, you know, where if we took the scripture, really dissected it, we could see where things really go deep in their meeting. But as Jesus is coming through that sheep gate, we see in uh, Nehemiah chapter 1 where those gates are first mentioned, the sheep gate is where people would bring in the animals for sacrifice, so as Jesus is coming into the city of Jerusalem, he intentionally comes through that north gate where pilgrims are coming through and they're bringing in all these sacrificial animals. So Jesus is doing the ministry, he has a great revival in Samaria. He's, the disciples are hearing him preach the gospel and he's coming into, into Jerusalem and he realizes that, hey, there's a price that is going to be paid. I am going to be the sacrifice. I am going to be the lamb that will be offered up that is going to take away the sin of the world. The field's white unto harvest, but there's a price that Jesus knows is going to have to be paid. But just inside of the gate, there's this pool where people would come and cleanse themselves. How many of you have ever been on a long trip before? You know, and, and uh, I remember we took a long trip across country from Florida to Montana, and uh, we stopped at a rest area in Kansas, and we got out, and they had uh, these, uh, uh, they're not water fountains, but they're spigots where you could actually get the water to kind of pour out. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I've seen those spigots before. Well, our kids had been in the vehicle for a long time. They were just toddlers, and <clears throat> man, we got out, and the kids, we could tell how restless they were. Well, we just decided, let's have some fun. And we turned those spigots on and we let our kids play in those spigots. And they were all refreshed. And you could see all the other little kids in the cars that were going to other places where, you know, they needed to be neat and tidy. But they just looked at my wife and I and our kids like, man, those lucky dogs. Man, they're out there playing in that water. Well, when people would come into the city of Jerusalem, they'd go by these pools and, you know, they'd be able to wash up. They'd be able to get all that dirt, all the grime from the road. They'd be able to get it off from them. And it was like this, the first attraction that you would see when you're coming in to the city of Jerusalem. But as you would come to the, the pool, there was a group of people that would gather there every day. Let's look at John chapter 5, verse 3 through 7. It says this, and here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, one who was there who had been an invalid for 38 years when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes in ahead of me. So when they came into the city of Jerusalem, there's this great pool. There's this great kind of uh, refreshing place. But all of the people who were blind, who were lame, who needed a physical miracle, they used to sit around that pool of water on those five porches. Anybody ever drive to Pensacola or Mobile, you get off the interstate and you see the people there with the signs needing help, you know, and, and, and they came in and it'd be, you know, they're, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel a little bit awkward. I don't want to make eye contact with them. <laughs> a little too honest for a Wednesday night, maybe. Come on. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You need to be honest and shame the devil right now because you know, if you make eye contact with them, you're going to have to give them some money. You know, so I'm always like, when I get off the interstate, I know you're not supposed to be on your phone or nothing, but man, it's amazing. I got an email or something when I get off the interstate. I'm trying to ignore those, you know, because I just never know if they really need help or not. But Jesus, when he comes in, he's not like I am when I get off the interstate. The first thing that Jesus does is that he finds this guy who's been there for 38 years and he asks him, hey, dude, do you want to get better or not? I started looking at that. I started thinking about that as we were preparing for the lesson. And now, if Jesus has has said this, do you hope to be made better? The man's answer might have made more sense. Because the man doesn't answer Jesus' question with yes or no. He deflects onto all the reasons why he can't get better. Do Do you see that when you're looking at it? Jesus just asking him a simple question. Hey, do you want to get better or not? 
It'd be like saying this. It'd be like saying, hey, Bruce, do you want to lose weight? And I go, yeah, I'd really like to lose weight, but I like food too much. <laughs> hey, Bruce, would you like a new sports car? Yeah, I'd love a new sports car, but I can't afford the new sports car. You know, I, it'd be like, you know, would you like to, you know, go on a great vacation? I'd love to go on a great vacation, but I don't have time off from work. I don't have money to do that. There's this deflecting. It's not a matter of yes or no. It's coming up with all the reasons in the world why I can't. He doesn't seem to realize who is asking him this great question. <laughs> You know, another great example would be this. If, you know, a little kid was visiting over to his friend's house and mom said, hey, would you like a snack? He goes, I'd love a snack, but I'm not allowed to walk back across the neighborhood to my house and get one. You know, mom be, the mom would be looking at him, kind of scratching her head going, uh, huh? No, I meant, I meant, I got a snack. Would you like a snack? See, in each of these cases, the person doesn't answer the question, but instead reflects on his or her own resources, capabilities, or external conditions around and asserts that the desirable goal isn't achievable. The person feels stuck. Can I tell you that the world is full of a bunch of people that feel stuck? When they ask, hey, do you want to be free? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to, you want to live a life that, that doesn't have all of these chains on it? Man, it's not a yes or no because they cannot see the answer or the solution. All they can see is the reason why they're stuck. Man, God doesn't want you to see all the reasons why you're stuck. He wants you to see that you can be free. Man, Jesus didn't die on the cross for us to, to deflect all the reasons why, you know, hey man, do you want to be free? Yeah, I want to be free, but, but, you know, I gotta be dead and go to heaven before that happens. Man, that's not the gospel that Jesus died for. It's not the gospel that we said yes to. Jesus standing there. Do you wish? Tonight, maybe let's make it a little more real. Maybe you're saying, hey, do you wish you had a better relationship with your father? Do you wish that you didn't feel so lonely? Do you wish that you weren't so self-conscious about yourself? Come on. Can I be real tonight with you? Do you feel like that you, that you, that you wish you could do better at your job? Have more influence? Man, do you wish you had more patience? That you could stand up for yourself better. Come on, how many of you ever, man, you know, after something happens, you, you go back and you're in your car, or maybe you, you go back to your desk and go, man, why didn't I say that? Man, if he, it, man, if that happens again, I'm gonna, you know, he's kind of back to, do you wish you weren't such a doormat? Do you wish that you weren't so troubled by thoughts of revenge, trying to get even? Do you wish that you were a better person? As we reflect on each of these questions, can't you imagine a person feeling stuck or unable to change? When in this frame of mind, a person could ask, where's God? Why can't God help me? Why do I always have to keep dealing with this day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year? There's a lot of people, they just live their life feeling stuck, wishing that things in their life could change. But John, 2,000 years ago, is very intentional about telling about the day that Jesus comes through the sheep gate and talks to a man who's been lame for 38 years who asks the simple question, yes or no? Tonight, it's not about this Bible study. It's not about my prayer or about your, but it's about this. Are you willing to stand before Christ in all of his glory, all of his power, and answer a yes, no question and let his work take place in your life? 
You see, this man was waiting for something supernatural, but instead he met someone supernatural. There's a lot of people, oh, Pastor Bruce, if, if I could just get a raise at my job. Pastor Reese, if I could just, you know, uh, uh, get an apology from the person that I've been holding this grudge against. Yeah. Pastor Reese, if I could just, you know, get this or get that or you're waiting for something to happen. Friend, quit waiting for something to happen because someone supernatural died on a cross, rose from the dead, took up residence inside of your heart and life, and he's ready to do the work for you. The invalid needed someone to help him. He needed something to happen. He was always waiting for something, something, the right condition, this or that. Listen, friend, I'm going to tell you, if you want to lose weight, don't wait till after Thanksgiving and Christmas. Make a decision right now that I'm going to change. <laughs> Y'all looking at me like I'm speaking in a different language. I'm Pentecostal, but I still think I'm speaking in regular language, aren't I? Most people are waiting for something to happen, but what they really need is to meet someone who can introduce them to this miracle worker whose name is Jesus. Man, when you come in contact with somebody, you talk, man, you know, I just, I need this to happen, I need that to happen. That's where the spirit needs to rise up inside of us. The anointing to speak the word and do the ministry needs to rise up inside of us. Says You don't need to wait on something or someone else or some condition. Friend, I got great news for you. Jesus is here right now and he can answer the question. He can meet the need. See, this man had to answer the question if he was going to be willing to change. Man, Jesus is there. He's wanting to. But here's what Jesus, man, (laughs) he asked the question. How many of you know that for you and I, when we're reading this, it seems like a rhetorical question? So, of course you want to, of course he does. But I tell you, in real life, with real people and real situations, this question is not as clear as it may seem. Hello. I got an honest confession. Are we broadcasting this via the internet? Can my parents see this at some point? Can we block an IP address? Oh, by the way, everybody online, welcome. We're glad to have you here tonight. When I was about seven years old, I was playing in the neighborhood. I've never told anyone this before in my whole life. Man, this is going to be good. I just feel better about to confess to Steve right now. And we were goofing around, and, and, I, and I got thrown around like, you know, and it was kind of embarrassing. And, you know, you, you ever get like whooped and you're on the ground and you, and you rather than just get up and, and tap, you know, tip your cap, you act hurt because, you, you know, you just, you want to. So, man, I, I'm laying on the ground. We're playing football or something. I was like, oh, you know, and, I, and I, my back, it did hurt a little. <laughs> you know, but, but people were like high-fiving the guy that knocked me out. They were like really concerned because I wasn't doing well. Well, I kind of got where I, man, I was like, well, it's kind of cool. I'm center of attention. And then the, the, the parents of the, the kid where we were playing, dude, now that I'm an adult, I'd kill a kid if he did this. Of course, they saw it. You know, I'm laying on the ground. I, I don't know if they're thinking, hey, is he okay or we're going to get sued. Either way, they come out and, and they're, hey, are you okay? Then all of a sudden, man, I, dude, I got to make a decision. Man, am I going to get up and just kind of shake this off or am I going to see this thing through? Well, you can just imagine which one I chose since we're telling the story. You know, man, my neighbor, he picked me up, took me inside, you know, and man, they set me on the couch and they, then they asked me if I wanted a cookie. That was mistake number two. <laughs> I'm getting a tension cookie. You know, I was like, oh man, my back, it's getting, you know, as it played out, you know, I was there. They were like, oh man, just take a little bit of time. You'll, you'll be okay. And 
Man, then they made caramel popcorn and put on a movie. Man, before I knew it, I was getting real comfortable with my injury. <laughs> Next thing I know, you know, man, can you, you know, because it wasn't that far. <laughs> it wasn't that far back in like 1978, man. You get arrested for child abuse if you let a kid walk that far today. But, you know, it's like, you know, are you, are you okay? Can you walk home? I don't know. I don't think so, you know. <laughs> my dad. I'm sorry, Dad. My dad came up. He ca- he carried me out and put me in the car and took me home, put me on the couch. Dude, you, I'm the youngest of five. You know, me and my twin brother. You know, uh, dude, there's hardly any pictures at my house of me. I mean, that you know, by the time you have three or four kids, man, you're lucky if people even know you have those kids. <laughs> you know, dude. The next morning, you know, how you doing? It was happening on a Saturday. You know, and now all of a sudden my dad starts getting worried and he's like, man, you know, everybody's getting ready to go to church. And friend, at my house, dude, it didn't matter how sick you were, man. My, the line at my church was go to church, take two aspirin, go to church and let them pray for you. I mean, that's kind of, you know, but it was, there was like this concern, you know, dude, and it's getting, I'll never forget. I didn't have to go to church that day and my dad kept contemplating it. Dude, and, and, and it got to the point now where it's like, maybe we need to take him to the emergency room. Dude, I was so far into this. Dude, I didn't know how to get out now. I remember, because it was like, well, take a bath and soak, see if that helps. Dude, I'm sitting in the tub thinking to myself, dude, I can't just walk out of here like I've been healed, you know. <laughs> if I'd have gone to church and they prayed for me, then, dude, we could have had a hallelujah spell, but... You know, I didn't how I didn't take that path. I remember getting, man, my dad loaded me up in the car, took me to the hospital. I'm in the emergency room. The doctor comes in. Dude, he starts pulling out needles and stuff. Man, I got Jesus quick. Man, I was, he's looking at, I don't know if the doctor had a clue or not, you know, but he's like, he said, do you think you can get off this, the gurney? Dude, I jumped off the gurney like, you know, I was jumping over a goal line or something. And my dad looked at me, he looked at me, and my dad goes, you think we need some x-rays or anything? He goes, no, Mr. Dumas, I don't think you need any x-rays or anything. Now, I'm going to tell you how young and stupid I was. When we left the hospital, I, I had the audacity to ask for pizza. <laughs> you know, all the way my dad, you're not getting, you know. But can I, it sounds like it's kind of funny, but can I tell you this? We can get so far into our conditions that we have that we don't know how to get out of them. We don't know, we don't know where the exit strategy is. We don't, you know, there's some people say, man, do you want to be free from drugs? But yeah, I, I do, but do you want to be free from that lifestyle? You know, well, I do, but, you know, and, and start deflecting. And, and, and when you have to really answer the question, man, I, there's one guy that, man, I was like, God really wants to set you free. He's got a great plan. But his response was, yeah, but I'm the life of the party, man. Everybody knows me. And he had this super cool nickname at parties because he'd get intoxicated and make a fool out of himself. Man, he, Jesus is wanting to set him free, but he had to contemplate what kind of change that meant for his life. And in Jesus' day, it wasn't just about, you know, just getting better and having that. Dude, the Romans would give you a special garment so that you could beg in public places. So for this guy, Jesus said, hey, are you willing to lay down the identity of being a cripple and the lifestyle and the means of getting by and making an income? And, you know, this guy for 38 years, same spot every day, same time, same channel. He's tuned in at this pool with five porches. There's some of us, there's some people that you're ministering to. Man, until they want to change, it's not going to change. But they will come a day. The man had to answer the question if he was willing to change. He had to contemplate what that meant to be healed. But can I tell you this, this this evening? Jesus loves us too much to leave us the way he found us. If you meet Jesus and you answer that question, yes, your life is going to change. I didn't get a lot of amens or even head shaking on that kind. I mean, Jesus wanted him to know, 
are you ready for the changes that are going to happen in your life? I know it sounds crazy, but I met somebody once that was healed and stayed in denial. You know? Man, can't find any signs of that. Man, check again. Are you crazy? But it, it becomes our it becomes an identity. It becomes but Jesus wants to change the identity. He wants to give a new purpose. And that may be scary, but Frank, can I tell you that when Jesus does change us, when the, the miracle takes place, the new path is an exciting path. It's a path that's worth it. John chapter 5, verse 8. Let's read on. I, my wife said, man, uh, you know, what's your intention? And I said, be short. I've never heard a bad short sermon. John chapter 5, verse 8 says this. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up the mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry that mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. I love that. Who said you could carry the mat? The man who healed me said I could carry the mat. I think John smiled when he wrote that. So they asked him, who's this fellow that told you to pick up and walk? And the man who was healed had no idea who it was. For Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. That's an odd part there. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus. who Man, what a tattletale. That's gratitude for you. Who had made him well. So because Jesus was doing things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. Man, this, this man that who had been healed, the physical crippling that he had, he's healed. He goes to the, the temple on the Sabbath. Man, and all of a sudden, there's another attack that comes against him. You see... Religion was trying to cripple him again. Don't become crippled by religion when you've been set free by Jesus. Now, I like this because, man, I, I, I've been free. But Jesus heals the man, which is good, but he does it on the Sabbath, which is bad. <laughs> The Jewish leaders deemed this a sin that was punishable by stoning. So when the guy, I'm joking around when I read the scripture, but man, when this dude, he's so happy, he's so free, uh, you know, he's going to the the temple because he hasn't been able to go to the temple in 38 years. When he gets there and the first thing that happens is he's threatened with an accusation that could get him killed. Now, it's not like, hey, you get a $5 fine. Dude, this is a, you broke the fourth commandment. Let's all go out to the gate. You're dead. You see, the problem is that the Jews had added over a thousand additions to what constituted the sin of breaking the fourth commandment. It got real bad. And can I tell you that it still is? (laughs) Man, the, the... it's like the Old Testament was too, the law was too easy. It was, it didn't have enough, you know, it didn't have enough safeguards. So they decided to be good guys and they'd add more. So they added over a thousand different things that constituted breaking the Sabbath. Can I tell you that when the sheep gate and the gates of the city and the Sabbath, you know, what it was is that you couldn't carry a load through the gate of the city on the Sabbath day. You know, it never was intended for what, These Jewish leaders had made it out to be. You say, well, man, that's crazy. Can I tell you that there are some Orthodox Jews today that still live under this, the law of this? Man, there's a couple of stories while I was kind of researching doing this. And, 
you know, I, for time's sake, I, I don't really have the time to rehearse them all. But, man, there were people that died in an apartment fire because there was a fire that got started and there was a argument on whether it constituted as work to pick up the phone and call the fire department. They had to consult with a rabbi to find out if making a call to the fire, this is a true story, constituted a breaking of the fourth commandment. And while they were arguing about it, the apartment next to theirs caught on fire and people lost their life. General Electric, now I, I didn't check this out myself, but, but it's on the internet, so it has to be true. Okay, so I just, I just, you know, give my sources here. But they have a Sabbath mode for stoves to where a stove can't turn on during certain periods, you know, because when Friday when the sun goes down until uh, Saturday when the sun goes down, they're not allowed to cook or do any of those things or carry anything. You know, and they've got all these kind of exceptions to the rules. And, man, it's crazy. I, it, you know, reading it, I was like, wow. You know, I thought, I thought my church was crazy. This is even crazier than that. <laughs> but, and the reason, how, how, many of you work in, how many of you work in like an industrial setting, whatever, and, and there's a rule that doesn't make any sense? How many of you know somebody did something so they had to make that rule? It's like, you know. Do not urinate on an electric... You know somebody did that. (laughs) They had to make a rule for the rest of us. Too far. (laughs) Sorry, Pastor Chad. Send your emails. No. Um, But because the Jews, if they left the stove on and something was burning, they couldn't go and turn the stove off if it had gotten into the Sabbath. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but can I tell you that there's a lot of people, man, that are just, they've been in religion so long, they have so many regulations and rules, they have forgotten what it is to be saved and set free by Jesus. See, here's what happens. People with a knowledge of God but that don't have a relationship with Jesus are left only with religious regulations. There's a lot of people that, man, they're excited that you're saved, but they may not necessarily be excited that you go to Coastal. My microphone's still on though, right? You know, you, you find Jesus, but the other people's like, if you don't go to our church, and you don't adhere to all these regulations and, you know, all this blah, 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 blah. Man, I was having a conversation with one guy and, you know, I'm talking to him and, 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 and he's like, all these reasons why I can't come to Jesus. And, you know, he, he was drinking, a, I think he's drinking a beer or something, you know. He goes, yeah, but this, I said, look, drinking that beer may make you a bad Baptist, but it doesn't mean that you can't become a Christian. Assembly of God, fill in the blank with whatever it is. Because, friend, I can tell you this. Whatever liberty we have in Jesus, there's some church or religion out there that will try to take it away from you. Jesus didn't die. He didn't set us free to just go back into that bondage again. He set us free for freedom's sake. Now, I got to get going or I'm going to run out of time. I don't want to run out of time. The man's response to against the law was that the man who healed me said it was okay. Man, that's what we got to get in our walk with Jesus. Man, we got to walk with Jesus and be free with Jesus. Man, and we don't need to let men or or religion or anything put a noose, put a yoke around our neck and try to put us underneath bondage anymore. Friend, I'm going to tell you, if you give your heart to Jesus, you start praying, reading your Bible, you start living in the Spirit, man, you're going to know what's right and wrong. Dude, I got, I got, a, I got a, a one-year-old granddaughter. Man, she knows what's right and wrong. Dude, that, that we inha- but, dude, we got a, we walking in that freedom. This guy, man, the Jews are trying to get him back under the Old Testament law. He says, look, man, I don't know what the rules are. Man, Jesus heals another man of blindness. 
Man, they try to throw him out of the tabernacle. His response is, look, I don't know whether you're right or someone else right. All I know is this. I met a man. He prayed. He touched me. I was blind, and now I see. Who heals us is the one who leads us. He later met Jesus and receives this warning in verse 14. Jesus says, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Man, I know what you're thinking. Bruce, you were doing so good with that whole grace thing. And you just threw a law bomb out there. You could have skipped that part. Well, we could have skipped that part, but it's more important that we understand that part. Okay. Mate, stop sinning or something worse may happen. Three reasons why I think Jesus may have said this. Number one is the dude may have been a habitual sinner and was at risk of sin destroying his life again. We don't know how he died. Dude, he might have gotten wasted on wine and and walked out in front of an ox cart and got paralyzed. Man, just fill in the blanks. Jesus said, look, man, don't don't go crazy again, man. You You might be a quadriplegic next time. Right? Second thing was, he was tempted in the temple to deny Christ because of the pressure that was being put on him. He says, look, man, you be careful. Don't you miss this mark or something worse could happen in your life. Can I tell you this? I'd rather go through life maimed and blind, dumb and deaf and mute and, and live my life knowing that I was making it to heaven than to be healed, rich, well, well thought of by the world and go to hell. You say, look, don't give in to that pressure. But I think that the third reason may have been one that, I don't know, it just kind of makes more sense to me. But he was going to leave a life of grace to fall back under the burden of the law. And Jesus knew it would be better to live physically crippled than to walk under the burden of the law again. I think that's what Jesus, I think that Jesus may have been, look, Frank, can I tell you this? Man, who the son set free? Free indeed, don't go back. Don't, don't be set free by grace and exchange it for something else. Friends, sin, sin isn't, uh, it, it's not a, man, I did this or I didn't do that. Or, it, sin is missing the mark. If I don't want to tell you the mark that I don't want to miss, I don't want to miss the mark of living under the grace of Jesus Christ. Not walking in my own works, but walking in his works. The life I live, I live in Christ. Galatians chapter 2. Then Jesus, he's making it real. And Jesus, this is John when he's recording his gospel. This is the first recorded conflict with religious leaders. And he makes three things very clear. This is what Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is going to pick a fight. Okay. John records the first miracle. He records the first evangelistic outreach. And here he's the first religious kind of conflict that they're having. The first thing that Jesus says, man, because he, you know, John's not going to mince words. We're not going to have to wait till chapter seven to see, to find out, you know, what the real issues is that they're having with him. He says this, number one, he was equal with God in nature. John chapter 5, verse 17, it says this. In his defense, Jesus said to them, because they're wanting to know, Jesus, who do you think you are telling that guy he can carry his mat? And Jesus is saying this, well, I'm the guy who healed him. And not only that, I'm equal to God in my nature. <laughs> they weren't happy. And in his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at work in, in, to this very day. And I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even, he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Oop, there it is. Man, what more do they need to hear? The second thing that Jesus says that he is equal to God in power. You see, they knew this, that God was the one who gave the law. So if God was the one who gave the law, Jesus said, hey, look, I am God in my nature. I am God in my power. 
John chapter 5, verse 19 through 21, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. But because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. Jesus tell him this, man, you think healing that guy on the Sabbath day is a big deal? You just wait, man. More is coming. Dude, you know what? I think I'm just going to heal everybody I can on the Sabbath day just because it makes you mad. That's what he's saying. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Dude, Jesus, he not only said, hey, father, me, nature, says, man, I can raise people from the dead if I want. Dude, they understood that in the Jewish culture. That was reserved for like Old Testament superstars. You know, it only happened once in a while. Jesus saying, look, I can, I can raise anybody up I want. I can heal whenever I want. I can do whatever I want. And when my father says, when he's doing it, I'm doing it. Because of the equality that was there. The third thing is, equal to God in authority. John chapter 5, verse 22 through 30. Says this, moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son. Can you imagine these guys who have set themselves up to be judge? Over the law and everything, you say, look, God set me up to be the... These guys have got to be just like fuming. That all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Verily, truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and it is now come... When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for the time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice. Now there's another problem here. They don't believe in the resurrection. And come out, those who have done what is good will rise to life. Those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Guys, I want you to just, I don't want you to miss this, because it's so important to our life and our walk in Christ. This is the one who saved us. This is the one who's calling us. One day he will split the eastern sky, and he's going to come back and get us. Look, I'm not afraid. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not ashamed. Why? Because I serve one who is equal to God in his nature. I serve one who is equal to God in his authority. I serve one who is equal to God in all things. And he has set me apart. He saved me and he lives inside. Friend, I'm, man, you're not getting as excited as you should with the, what this word is saying to us tonight. Man, when, when you go to work, man, people go, who does he think he is? I'll tell you who I think I am. Jesus Man, he's making this declaration. And then I'm going to close with this. Ooh, look at the clock. Doing good. And some of you are going to get home for halftime. Jesus calls four witnesses to his defense. Man, don't you love this, how John's building the case for Jesus being the son of God? You know, he's not caring about all the little things, man. John chapter 5, he's making the case. Dude, that first miracle, first conflict, he's making the case. Jesus calls four witnesses to his defense. The first witness that Jesus says, and, and you know, I wish I had a better kind of analogy for witness. I, I like analogies, I like word pictures. But just think about it. Jesus is like, he's just made some ridiculous claims. And, and they're, they're worthy of death in the days. That, man, Jesus just blasphemed in a huge way. You know, and, and they're about to, you know, cast judgment on him. Jesus said, oh, but wait a minute. I've got some witnesses to back up what I just said. And the first witness that he calls in John chapter 5, verse 31 and 35, he calls the witness of John the Baptist. Now, I'm not going to read those scripture verses. You can read them uh, later or in your devotions this week. 
But John the Baptist was an important figure during Jesus' ministry. And the reason was, it's not because of the weird dress and all the other things, is that, man, he could really work up the Jews, you know, in a really good hallelujah revival meeting. He's out in the wilderness and he's baptizing. But, dude, this guy would take on the Romans, and they loved it when someone took on the Romans. This guy stands up, man, and he calls out the governor. You know, it's eventually going to get him killed when the time comes in his life. So he loved it. And the people, they thought John was a prophet from God. So Jesus says, man, I want to tell you, I got one witness. His name is John the Baptist. When he says that, there's a lot of confusion that comes because they're like, you know what? That's right. John the Baptist has done but good things to say about this guy. So his witness, man, it carried a lot of weight. There'll be times in Jesus' ministry where he'll quote John the Baptist and and, and he'll create a, a, a real paradox for them. And they can't really do what they want to because, man, the people are going to respond in a negative way because of what John the Baptist said about Jesus. The second thing that Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 36, he says, it's the witness of his works. Remember when Pastor Charlie did John chapter 3 last week? Nicodemus comes and he is a respected teacher of the law and and he goes he this is what he says about christ no one can do the things that you do unless you're sent by god so jesus he drops this bomb on the religious institution he goes man i got the wisdom of john the baptist i've got the witness of the works that i'm doing the third thing he says is that i've got the witness of my father the witness of god Man, one of the most powerful scripture stories is where Jesus goes to the Mount of Transfiguration. But Frank, can I tell you this, that that's not the first time the father endorsed and said he was well pleased with the son, but at his baptism. Friend, the baptism when Jesus comes, there's a lot of people there. Man, they may not have had the National Enquirer or the New York Times or the internet, but buddy, I'm gonna tell you what, when God comes down like a dove and says, this is my son whom I'm and John the Baptist says, that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It talks about he's not even worthy to take his shoes off. He's got the witness of his father. But this is the one that, and they're all great. There's none better than the other, but there is one that's my favorite. Jesus says this in John chapter five, verse 39 and 47 that he has the witness of the scriptures. The law that you bind around your fort, the, the, the law that you pound on the, the doorpost of your house, that scripture speaks of me. Let's all stand this evening. I know that in the day and age and the political correctness that we live in, Everybody wants to make everything equal. But can I tell you this? Everything is not equal. The Quran is not equal to the Bible. The, the Hebrew, it's not, you know, the, the Vishu and Hindu and Sikh, all these things, they're not equal to the Bible. The Bible is authoritative. Here's one of the ironic things about the Bible. It's not accurate because I believe it. It's accurate because it's accurate. <laughs> you know, well, why is the Bible true? Because I believe it's true. Well, I believe in Santa Claus. For, don't want to let that cat out of the bag. It's not a belief something doesn't mean it's true. It's true because it's true. There's a lot of people that were critical of the scripture. And one of the, the things that they said that disproved the Bible was they couldn't find this site in archaeological digs. So, well, you know, the Bible, there's just no, you know, we can't prove that. There's no archaeological proof for this event. Can I tell you about 100 years ago, they started digging in the dirt and found that gate, found that pool, found those five porches. They they didn't have the New Testament. It was the Old Testament. Peter W. Stoner, many of you have heard this. I love this illustration. He wrote wrote a book entitled Science Speaks. It's not that scientists don't believe in the Bible. It's just the dumb ones don't believe in the Bible. 
Sorry, I don't know, you know. But he writes this book and he writes about the probabilities of Jesus being who he said he was, the son of God, and have done the things that he said he did. There's a lot of scriptures that are there. 270 different, but there's 60 major prophecies. And he started doing the calculations. And if eight of the 60 major prophecies Jesus fulfilled, the chances of Christ being who he said he was and those prophecies being correct, it's one to the 10th to the 17th power. It's a whole bunch of zeros. You know, one of the things, I, I'm not political, but one of the things, I, one of the lines I loved best in the election was that they were talking to Donald Trump's son and, you know, and they asked him, why do you think your father would be a good president? He said, because everyone who gets on TV and says the word a trillion dollars, my father's head looks like it's going to explode. Can I tell you this? Sometimes words and numbers, they, they, we can't attach any real significance to them. How many of you know what I'm talking about? But he goes on, and, and rather than just give us a number, he gives us, a, he gives us an illustration. He says this, is that he computes it to silver dollars. He says that that would be enough silver dollars to cover the entire state of Texas two feet deep. Now, if you've been to Texas or you've had to drive across Texas, you know that it's miserable and it's big. Texas, very big state. But he said this, is that take those silver dollars, cover the whole state two feet deep, and then take a man and blindfold him, stick him in the middle, and then tell him to walk in any direction. And on his first attempt to pick up a silver dollar and pick up the one marked as intentional, that one silver dollar, that is what that number means. Frank, can I tell you this this evening? Jesus he is who he said he is. He can do what he said he can do. And we don't have to wait for the right conditions. We don't have to wait for the stars to align. We, listen, if you want your life to change, it could change. Why? Because Jesus is who he said he was and he came so that you could be free. Jesus has the power to change. He can change our situation, but he wants to change our situation by changing us the power Jesus has is in who he is and not in who we are or what we do tonight he loves you he cares about you and I don't know what it is that is crippling you in your life I don't know what it is that you may be struggling with I don't know what the conditions are that maybe you're here and you've never accepted Christ as your savior and you're just waiting for the right time the right day the right circumstance friend congratulations you've come on the right day this is the right time and these are the right circumstances the water is troubling for, troubled for you tonight to step in the scene with head bowed eyes closed I'm going to ask our prayer team to come it's our first Wednesday and we want to give you an opportunity to come and just to agree with somebody in prayer and we'll get to that in a moment but if you're here this evening and maybe you don't know Christ as your savior and you've been waiting and, and you don't know what you've been waiting for but friend, I'm telling you the wait is over Jesus is here and he wants to change your life but that's you tonight would you just raise your hand and say man tonight I want to give my life to Jesus I want to accept him as my savior is there anyone here tonight say I see that hand is there anybody else pray for me tonight's my night I want to give my life to Christ can we pray this prayer together dear Jesus I am not waiting any longer it's not about me it's all about you I know I'm a sinner and I need salvation come into my heart change my life I believe you are God's only son who died on the cross to save me from sin and I give my life to you do with me as you please in Jesus name tonight you may be here you may be saved and, and, and you're walking in life but there's there's something I don't know what it is it may be physical emotional it may be a situation that hasn't changed but you've been praying for it whatever it may be but you say Bruce, tonight, I, I need, man, 
I need Jesus to change something in my life. I, whatever it is, just raise your hand and I say, there's a reason why you toiled over this. Man, man, I need Jesus to come and do something in my life. Come on, if that's you. Look, Jesus asking the question. I'm not asking the question. Jesus asked the question. He said, do you want to be healed for, of that? Do you want that to change? Jesus wants to change that for you. He wants to change it by changing you this evening. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight and we thank you. Tonight, if you're here and you want prayer, I'm just going to encourage you to slip out. Find one of our prayer teams. They've been trained to pray and agree with you. And just, man, don't, don't walk it alone. Man, the Bible says where two or three are gathered together. It says if any two agreeing on one thing, man, there's, there's strength in that. Don't, don't abandon that strength and walk out.